So now we have a simple criterion to decide for a differentiable function where it is increasing or decreasing. So let's try to apply this uh, to a, a specific function. For instance, a function 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed minus 12x squared plus 5. And we want to find the intervals of increase and decrease for that function. According to the theorem, that depends on where the function f prime is positive and where the function f prime is negative. So we start by calculating f prime. In this case, it's a polynomial, it's easy to obtain. We just use the power rule. 4x to the 4th x cubed and x squared, and we obtain 12x cubed minus 12x squared minus 24x. What we want to know about f prime is its sign. In other words, for what x it's positive, for what x it's negative. Therefore, we're going to factor f prime. Here, this is an important point that when you're looking for the sign of a function, you want to have it in factored form because then. If you determine the sign of each one of the factors, you can conclude about the sign of the product. So in this case, we can factor out 12x, and it's multiplied by x squared minus x minus 2. And you see that x squared minus x minus 2 is 0, for instance, at x equal 2. So we can factor this further as 12x, x minus 2x plus 1. Now we want to find the sign of this product. As I said, this depends only on the sign of each individual factors. So here is how we're going to organize the information we have to find the sign of f prime. I'm going to build a table. At the top, I have the top row with the values of x. These values of x are going to be put in increasing order from left to right. So you can think of the top as the usual real line with negative infinity on one side, positive infinity on the other. Then I'm going to have uh, a row for each factor, and these factors are going to vanish, in other words, take the value 0, at negative 1, at 0, and at 2. These are the three places where we may have a change of sign. So I'm going to place these three values in increasing order at the top, and build columns corresponding to um, where these values are. Now I look at the sign of each factor, starting with 12x. 12x is positive if x is greater than 0, that is, on the right-hand side of 0. So I put a positive sign in that row, in the columns corresponding to values of x that are greater than 0. And you see that um, in these two columns where I have uh, put a, a plus sign, the first one corresponds to the interval from 0 to 2, the second one to the interval from 2 to infinity. 12x is 0 when x is 0, and is negative when x is less than 0. So I put a negative sign on the left side of 0. What about x plus 1? x plus 1 is positive if x is greater than negative 1. Greater than negative 1 means to the right of negative 1. So I put positive signs to the right of negative 1. x plus 1 is 0 at negative 1, so I put a 0 here. And it is negative otherwise if x is uh, less than negative 1. So I put a negative sign in the interval corresponding to x less than negative 1. Similarly, x minus 2 is positive if x is greater than 2. That means on the right of x equal 2. So I put a plus sign on the right of x equal 2, corresponding to the interval to infinity. It is 0 at 2, and it is negative if x is less than 2, so to the left of 2. So I put negative signs in the other columns, corresponding to x less than 2. What does that mean for f prime? f prime is the product of these three factors. So if you look, for instance, at the first interval, where x is between negative infinity and negative 1. What we have determined so far is that all three factors take negative values when x is in this interval. f prime is the product of these three factors. So I'm multiplying three negative numbers. If I multiply the first two, I get something positive. Multiply by something negative, I get something negative. So f prime is going to be negative when x is in this interval from negative infinity to negative 1. Similarly, if x is between negative 1 and 0, 
we have found that we have two factors that are negative, the product is positive. And when we multiply by the third factor, which is positive, we obtain something positive. So f prime is positive on that interval. Between 0 and 2, we have two positive factors and one negative factor. So if we multiply them all, we get something negative. And when x is greater than 2, all three factors are positive, so the product is positive as well. On the other end, at negative 1, 0, and 2, each time one of the factors is 0, so the product is 0. So we have completely determined the sign of f prime. For each value of x, we know whether f prime is going to be positive or negative. Now we want to interpret this for the function f. So we go back to the CRM and look at what we have. In the first interval, from negative infinity to negative 1, f prime is negative. And the CRM says if f prime is negative on an interval, then the function is decreasing on that interval. Symbolically, I'm going to indicate that with an arrow that points down this way. So this is the case on the interval negative infinity, negative 1, and on the interval 0, 2. On the other hand, when f prime is positive, we know that the function is increasing. In other words, I'm going to indicate that with an uh, arrow pointing up. And that happens on the interval negative 1, 0, and on the interval 2, infinity. So I have found the intervals of increase and decrease explicitly, and they are written down here. <coughs> One more observation on this. We see that here, obtaining the intervals of increase and decrease, we also obtain something more for free. Look at this place here. At x equal negative 1, we see that the function is decreasing before and increasing afterwards. So it goes down and then up. It should be clear that at x equal negative 1, the function f is going to take its smallest value at least near negative 1. So that means that at x equal negative 1, we have a local minimum. How do we find the corresponding minimum value? Well, this is the value that the function f takes at negative 1. So you plug negative 1 in the function. In this particular case, we would obtain 0. So I put a 0 here to indicate the minimum value that the function f takes at negative 1. Well, the, it's a local minimum. Similarly here, at x equals 0, we see that the function is increasing before x equals 0, decreasing after. So it goes up and then down. And so uh, at x equals 0, we are on top of the hill. So we have a local maximum for the function f at 0. To obtain the corresponding value of the function, recall that the function was 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed minus 12x squared plus 5. Unfortunately, I didn't write it back here. So when you plug x equals 0 in this, you obtain 5. So I put 5 in my table as the maximum local maximum value reached by the function at 0. And at x equal 2, again, we have this pattern of the function going down before x equal 2 and up after x equal 2. So we reach a bottom at x equal 2. In other words, the function f has a local minimum at 2. And to obtain this minimum value, you plug x equal 2 in the original function. In this case, we obtain negative 27. So I put that in my table. More generally, what we have applied here is a result that is often referred to as the first derivative test. Why test? Because it is a way to test the critical value of a function. We have seen before that if a function has a local extremum at a value c, then this value c is critical. But we also have seen that a critical value may or may not correspond to a local maximum or a local minimum. So we need to be able to test the critical value. Test in the sense of deciding for that critical value whether it corresponds to a local maximum, a local minimum, or neither. This is exactly what this first derivative test does. 
So if C is a critical value for a continuous function f, where the function is uh, differentiable near C, that means on some open interval centered at C, except possibly at C, we have three cases. If this derivative changes sign from positive to negative at C, then f has a local maximum at C. So let's see what that means. What do we mean by changes from positive to negative at C? It means that uh, if f prime takes positive values for x less than c and negative values for x larger than c, then the interpretation for f is that it goes up and then down, and then uh, we should have a local maximum at c. On the other hand, if f prime changes from negative to positive at c, then f is going to have a local minimum at c. Here what we mean by changes from negative to positive is that f prime takes negative values on the left of c and positive values on the right of c and therefore the function f goes down and then up and we have a local minimum. Third possibility, f prime does not change sign at c even though c is a critical value. So it could be that f prime is not defined at c or that it takes a value zero but uh, keeps the same sign on either sides of C. So for instance, we could have that C is a critical value, but F prime is negative on both sides, and then F would decrease on both sides, and that means there is no local extremum at C. So the pictures that we have uh, looked at here um, are next to all three cases. We have seen in the previous example and this particular function for which we looked for intervals of increase and decrease, examples corresponding to local maxima or minima. On the other hand, we didn't really uh, look at an example where the derivative does not change sign at the critical value. So consider, for instance, f of x equal x cubed. And we're looking for local extrema. So uh, local extrema can only happen at critical values, so we first need to find the critical values, which are the places where the derivative is either zero or undefined. In that case, it's a polynomial, so critical values are going to be just the zeros of the derivative. The derivative is 3x squared, it is zero at zero and at zero only, so the only critical value is x equals zero. But you see that if we look at f prime, it's 3x squared, it is always positive or zero. It is zero at zero, but it is positive on either side of zero. Therefore, f stays increasing on either side. And you see, uh, with the graph of the function, that there is no local extremum at x equals zero. Now, to see more examples of applications of this first derivative test, turn to the next video.